Welcome to the U.S.-China Global Education Television Series, presented by the Confucius Institute, U.S. Center, in partnership with the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. This 10-part series brings together presidents of universities and cultural institutions that host the Confucius Institute, along with distinguished American business, diplomatic, and educational leaders to discuss the importance of global education, language development, and people-to-people -people exchange between the United States and China. My name is Tony Cully Foster, and I'm the President and CEO of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Our focus is on global education, international affairs, and global communications. Like the Confucius Institute U.S. Center, we build educational bridges and advance international understanding between students, teachers, and professionals in the United States, China, and worldwide. We have a valued strategic partnership with the Confucius Institute, U.S. Center. Their focus is on Chinese language development, global education, and people-to-people -people exchanges between the United States and China. It's my honor today to be here with my friend and colleague, Professor Gao Qing, the Executive Director of the Confucius Institute U.S. Center, who will introduce our program today. Thank you, Tony. We are honored to be joined today by two distinguished speakers at the Ronald Reagan Building. Dr. Ronnie Green, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and Secretary Chuck Hagel, former U.S. Secretary of Defense. Dr. Ronnie Green is the 20th Chancellor of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He is an internationally recognized expert and leader in animal science and genetics. Under his leadership, University of Nebraska-Lincoln seeks to lead the way in addressing key global challenges and attract and educate talented students from Nebraska and around the world, including China. The Confucius Institute at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln is recognized as a model Confucius Institute. He will be interviewing Secretary Hegel who has led a distinguished career as a politician, educator, and business executive. Secretary Hegel served as the 24th U.S. Secretary of Defense and two terms in the United States Senate representing the state of Nebraska. Prior to joining the Senate, he served as a president of McCarthy and Company investment banking firm in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, let's join our speakers for this very important dialogue. Thank you very much, Dr. Gell, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight and to be in the, <clears throat> the Reagan Trades, International Trade Center here in D.C. Uh, and thank you very much to the Confucius U.S. Institute uh, Center uh, as well as the World Affairs Council for co-hosting these conversations that are so important in thinking about the, the increasing, we believe, importance of global education in higher education. I'm, I'm just going to make a very brief opening kind of follow-up to the introduction that you heard about the Confucius Institute and about how we value that at our university in Nebraska. Uh, we're now in the process of celebrating our 10th anniversary of the founding of our Confucius Institute at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And for some context, we're a, a university of about 26,000 students, about 5,000 graduate students, 21,000 undergraduate students from 138 countries around the world and from almost every state uh, in the United States. So we're, we're, a, we're in our, of ourself a global institution and we're very proud of that. The Confucius Institute um, was a uh, brainchild, I think, I should say, Dr. Wood of our former chancellor, Chancellor Harvey Perlman, uh, who retired from the post a year ago. Uh, he was my immediate predecessor who, was, who has been honored 
internationally by Hanban and by the Confucius Institutes for his service uh, to the CIs. We see this as a dual exchange. So understanding of Chinese culture and language certainly is at the center of the mission of the CIs and the Confucius Institute efforts. But we also see this as, I think the opening speaker said, as a dual exchange. So we see this as placing our students in China as well as having opportunity for our Chinese counterparts to be here in the US. Uh, we do that through a number of relationships with important Chinese universities directly, institution to institution, so that we can send our students to those universities as well. And we've been very, very pleased at the impact that that is having on our student body. Uh, so we, we, uh, we believe in the mission. Uh, we're living that mission and we're seeing success from our Confucius Institute efforts. Now I'm really privileged tonight to have the opportunity to kind of lead this conversation with Secretary Hagel. Um, he has quite an impressive uh, history of his own that we're going to draw upon in our conversation tonight. I had the privilege of hearing Chuck speak as our commencement speaker at the University of Nebraska just in this past year. Uh, and the message that he sent to our students had a little bit of that global importance um, in the education system as part of that message. Now, you, you know the big things about Chuck. You know that he's the former Secretary of Defense. You know his long service and political service as the senator from the great state of Nebraska, as has been mentioned. But you may not know some of his earlier you know, parts of his life. So I'm gonna start our dialogue tonight, Chuck, just by asking you to talk a little bit about from whence you came and a little bit about your own background and your own educational history, your earlier service to our country. Just tell us a little bit about some of your earlier background. Uh, Ronnie, thank you very much. And I wish to echo Chancellor Green's comments in acknowledging and thanking uh, both of your institutions for what uh, you do, continue to do to make a better world for all of us. And to the Reagan Center, thank you for uh, allowing us to borrow your facilities tonight. It looks like a responsible group, and I uh, doubt if there'll be any, any turmoil here, uh, as opposed to other places uh, recently. But uh, thank you all in the audience uh, for what uh, you each do to contribute to uh, a better world and a more significant understanding between our two countries, but also globally. Uh, Ronnie, I am a, uh, a product, a real product of Nebraska. I was born and raised uh, one of uh, four boys in uh, little towns out in western Nebraska and grew up not unlike uh, most kids in Nebraska with a healthy regard for uh, our, our state, in particular, Cornhuskers. <laughs> um, values, uh, I was fortunate to have parents and teachers and coaches and mentors and people I work for uh, who had values. And that, uh, of course, as you all know, because education is about values, it is primary, it's fundamental to the kind of world that we continue to strive for. Uh, so I was fortunate with the kind of background and growing up I had. I um, attended uh, four colleges before I graduated uh, from one. So my academic background is not one to be emulated uh, in any way. But uh, once I became anchored and got myself on track, um, I graduated the University of Nebraska uh, at Omaha, which I'm very proud of that. But I um, kid people as I have gone all over the world over many, many years and uh, referenced the fact that uh, anyone from Nebraska got an unfair start in life. But uh, I, in, in many ways, that's true, but in many ways in this country is not true. And it is really about, uh, I think, who we are. Uh, but 
embodied as much as any place I know. I haven't lived everywhere in Nebraska. So I'm very proud to be a Nebraskan and proud to have an opportunity to serve in different capacities that I have had over the years. Uh, Secretary, I know that you have traveled to China extensively over the years and had a lot of involvement um, in China. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience in China? Maybe one of, what, one of your most memorable experiences might have been um, in your, your experiences there? Probably my most memorable, um, and I've had many memorable experiences uh, in China. I don't know how you go to China and not have a memorable experience. But uh, my first experience in China, um, I was uh, president of a cellular telephone company that uh, my partners and I had just started. And I started um, an international company because I always felt that if technology enhanced America, and particularly wireless telephony, uh, what it could do for developing countries and economies everywhere. And so uh, in those days, this was the early 80s, uh, of course no one knew what cellular was, they thought it was some kind of a, a medical term. And um, so I started referring to it as wireless telephony, wireless telephones is what it is, to make it uh, simple. And there was only one company that produced cellular telephone companies at the time, that was Motorola. And those telephones, many of you may recall, were the size of a brick. And there were only 500 in the country. So I uh, uh, took two Motorola engineers with me to China. And uh, one of uh, the engineers that I had hired from AT&T in our international company, and uh, a, um, a woman who had been assistant secretary of state in the Carter administration, Susan Levine, some of you might know Susan, but she spoke very fluent Chinese as an interpreter. And we arrived um, in Beijing on January 2nd, 1984. In those days, there was only one flight a week in and out of Beijing, out of New York. It was a Pan Am flight and uh, so you, if you went to Beijing on that flight, you were there for at least a week, um, as far as thinking you were coming back to the United States. We were there two weeks, and uh, yes, Beijing, it was as cold as I've ever been in my life. Uh, but um, we also took the train to Tinian and spent time in factories there working with uh, various Chinese engineers. Um, we, of course, went to Shanghai and, um, in, in Beijing. And then on the way out, we went to Canton, which is no longer Zhongdao, I think, is the name of the city now. But it's no longer referred to as Canton, which was each city which struck me in China uh, it, it, because the immensity of the country. But what struck me particularly about each of those four cities that we were in was how different each of those cities was. Canton was uh, then, of course, very close across the water from Hong Kong in the south. So it was a tropical, very sophisticated, very sophisticated. Um, the northern part of China was not. And so I think, you know, I've been there a dozen times back, maybe more met with uh, President Xi a couple of times, the leaders uh, the last, I think, since 1997, all the leaders of China. Um, every one of those trips has, me has been memorable. That one was, was the most. Second most memorable was Senator John Chafee and I uh, took a plane in 2000 when we were um, there in Japan for the Kyoto climate change conference. I was the chairman of the congressional uh, delegation on climate change that led the congressional delegation to the, the UN treaty uh, in Kyoto. And we got there early, so uh, I talked to Senator Chafee, who has since passed away, about going into China, and we did. But we, they allowed us, the Chinese government allowed us to take a military plane 
a U.S. military plane deeper into China than uh, had, had ever been allowed to go in. And we went to um, Chengdu, uh, marvelous place, home of the pandas and so on. But what struck me about Chengdu was their environmental projects, the sophistication of those environmental projects. So those are the two most memorable, but each time I'm there, it's memorable. So boy, it's changed so when you talk about one flight a week from New York, right, to today that is constant, right, into every yes. major, every one of the tier one cities in China and, and beyond. So so Chuck, you've, you've had a lot of different vantage points, right? So you had the vantage point as a business executive you talked about, you've had the vantage point as a U.S. Senator and Foreign Relations Committee member and you know, your reference to the Kyoto Accord a minute ago and that kind of vantage point, you've had the vantage point as, US, as a U.S. Senator, as a U.S. Secretary of Defense. Um, has, your, has your view changed from any of those vantage points and how you perceive uh, China and the country's development over that same time period? So talk to me a little bit about that. Is it, do you see it any differently from any of those vantage points and how that change has occurred? Well, as we all know, um, China is one of the, uh, I think history will record this years from now, is uh, one of those very uh, unique examples of astounding, uh, astounding development and progress. Now, um, I also know that uh, a lot of people uh, are left behind. And what you see in Beijing or Shanghai is not what the whole country is about. So I think you have to always recognize that reality. But what the Chinese have been able to do as big, with as, as big a country, diverse a population, huge population, uh, to assemble institutions of governance, of, of societal responsibility. Now, it doesn't comport with exactly the U.S. model, of course not. But, but just that accomplishment in itself is, is significant. Now, as to the changes, every time I'm there, I see uh, something. There's a, there's a change somehow, somewhere. And I'm not a historian, and I'm not near as learned as many in this audience about China. Uh, but I, I do know a little something about history. Because China has had to deal with so much, uh, it has veered, I think, back and forth, in and out of lanes, global economic power. Um, well. When you when you look at that and you look at the models of global economic powers, uh, with trade alliances and so on, you you assume that there's in in those alliances, those relationships, um, market economies. You assume there has to be some openness and a freedom of institutions and freedom of um, uh, entrepreneurship and, and other dynamics that go into that. It doesn't just start with opening up a shop. Uh, it, it's far more basic than that. It, it, it is laws, it's regulation, it's a lot of things, taxes. And so I think China has struggled, and I think is still struggling with, with that. Um, I don't think that should be particularly surprising, considering how big China is, considering the population, considering where China came from, um, and and what they have accomplished, but I do think that China is uh, is in now in a period where it's going to have to start defining itself and making some t difficult decisions about what kind of a country it wants for its people. Um, more freedoms, more openness, and uh, that may not be what the Chinese people 
uh, want? I don't know. But it seems to me that that, that they are at that juncture in the history of peoples and nations because they've accomplished so much. And now they're going to have to define themselves as to who are we and what kind of a country China is more than they've ever had to do. Every country goes through that. Well, let's, let's take a little different topic here. So on the issue of global education, uh, you've traveled around the world in your capacities and you've seen the global uh, marketplace, so to speak. Um, what kind of skills do you think are important today for students in the U.S., students in China, to have to be successful in the, the global world in the future? Well, I, I think it, it is not unique skill sets to any one nation or culture or people, as every, certainly you know this, Ronnie, far better than I do, and uh, especially the educators in this room, that the capacity to listen and learn I mean, I mean those, those are the most important dynamics of anyone who is uh, successful in life. And it is a constant learning process. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more students, uh, all people, can equip themselves with knowledge of other countries, other cultures, uh, widen their horizons, uh, open their perspectives, uh, recognize that um, each culture is different, every country is different. Uh, we come from different backgrounds and we've, we've got to recognize that in, in how we deal with countries and people. And I'm not sure we always do that particularly well. Now that doesn't mean that, that, that you pull back on trying to make a better world or do the things that you believe are important for people to help people in the world, uh, not at all. But y y you can't, you can't uh, judge other countries, especially uh, on the time frame of, for example, our country 2017. Uh, we wouldn't look particularly good in a lot of ways 241 years ago. That's why we have 27 amendments to the Constitution. We didn't get it all right the first time. Half the, the women in this room couldn't vote in this country 100 years ago. But we've been able to self-correct, and that is a critical part of all this. And that's the last point I'd make about students. Uh, always do what you can to enhance yourself to be able to self-correct. None of us are that good. None of us, none of us are that smart. None of us are that capable. We all and each of us need people and others to help us. I've never known anybody in my life, and start with me, that um, wasn't enabled and helped by a lot of people along the way. So the Confucius Institutes around the U.S. and around the world, so there are 110 here in the United States at major universities around the country. The mission there is... Uh, to increase appreciation for Chinese language uh, as well as Chinese culture uh, here for us in the U.S. in that, in that way. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, your view of the importance of that mission or, or how, how important that might be for students here in the U.S. especially? Well, I, I think, again, it's fundamental to any understanding of uh, other peoples. Because if you, if you miss that component, um, you miss the centerpiece of a relationship. And uh, you can't base a relationship only on the mutual common economic interests of nations. Um, yes, there's a certain aspect of that uh, in, in nation to nation relationships, or, nor just on security relationships alone. Um, it's got to be deeper than that if it's sustainable. And so what the Confucius Center does and uh, other institutions, and, and University of Nebraska has done a magnificent job with this, as other institutions have, 
is is go deeper down into that understanding and uh, try to understand each other's culture. Why is it, and I learned this in business a long time ago with these international companies, why, why is it that I could not make my point with various leaders in the telecommunications business all over the world? Well, it doesn't make any difference where you go. You've got to dial in and get to where, where they, they are. And it isn't necessarily on our channel. Mm -hmm. uh, and so culture helps you do that as much as any one thing, because also it, it's a recognition that you respect, that you respect people. And if you do not have that in any kind of relationship, I don't care if it's a personal relationship, whatever it is, you can't sustain the relationship. And, um, that's the magnificent thing about people-to-people -people programs. It, it takes the politics out. It takes the economics out, the security out. No, those are realities, of course. But, but it's education. It's culture. It's coming back and forth with each other as human beings. And just one last point. I have often said that every country I've been in, regardless of religion, history, culture, ethnicity, difference. There is a fundamental sameness to every human being, starting with our needs. Food, your specialty, water, oxygen. But it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. I've never met a culture or religion that, didn't, that the parents didn't want good things for their children or their children to be safe. Now, different Cultures have different dynamics to that. I get that. I know. I know. But, but, but we're people. We're human beings. And what Confucius Center does and other institutions that work closely with them, like the University of Nebraska, is help foster that. And I think the world will be, would be much more secure, much more peaceful uh, in every regard if, if we had more of that underpinning in our relationships. You know, there's a... This thing of technology that's changed so rapidly even in the last number of years, the speed with which technology is changing, the speed with which information flow happens, you know, the rapidity of that, you know, it's very fast moving. You know, Moore's Law is at work here mm -hmm. for sure. Um, one might argue that with those new kinds of technologies and ways to communicate that we could have even greater exchange between mm -hmm you know, all parts of the world on the educational system. So let's, let's say students in Nebraska and students in Xi'an, China, you know, communicating with one another in a virtual way that we didn't have, you know, 10 years ago in the same kind of format. So we're certainly seeing those kinds of things happen, but there still is that need for human connection and human understanding that you were just, you were just kind of intimating toward in your last comments. You know, how important is it for students to spend time in China, students to spend time in the U.S., on the ground, in the culture, right, and to immerse themselves in that culture? We have nearly 1,300 Chinese students at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and we're very proud of those Chinese students, that we have that number of students on our campus. But we have to immerse ourselves in the culture as well. When the students come to us, we want them to immerse in our culture. When our students go to Xiangzhou Tang University or to Beijing University, we want them to immerse in the Chinese culture as well. So t can you talk a little bit about how importance there or how you might see that? Well, it, I think it's absolutely fundamental, again, to take that relationship building and understanding of cultures uh, to that to that level to have an opportunity unfortunately a lot of people don't uh, both in China and the United States but there is nothing that can substitute for that for for being right there um, living uh, in that culture for a time or at least a, an awareness of it to, to be there whether it's, it's the food the housing it's the smell the look it, it's it's everything is part of it 
And um, I, I think it's just so important for uh, all our countries to put the kind of resources we need to apply uh, to help our young people uh, get um, uh, get to that level. Now, everyone's not going to be a specialist. I, we, we understand that. I mean, the reality in life is you have to make a living, and you got the reality of the pressures uh, on, on you, and once you get out of the kind of safe cocoon of college living, um, and you've got to go out into the real world, and that's, it's the real world. But again, I go back to what I said earlier. The more you can equip yourself, it enhances your own ability, too, to make a living and do other things. So uh, any way you come at the uh, cultural immersion of being there in China or being here in the United States is, is I think, just critically important to taking these things the next uh, step. So certainly the U.S.-China bilateral relationship has expanded dramatically. You know, I still remember President Nixon's first visit you know, in the early 1970s as a youngster watching that on TV. And, and now to think of the relationship we have between our two countries and the expansion of that, it's pretty phenomenal um, that it has occurred this way. So even this week, you know, last week, Nebraska beef, you know, our, one of our signature products uh, arriving in China again for the first time in a number of years. Can you, can you speak, Chuck, a little bit to the importance of that expanding bilateral relationship? What's that meant for both of our countries? Well, another anchor in relationship building among nations, among people, is trade. Because it goes hand in hand uh, with education, uh, cultural exchanges, because trade is no guarantee, but it's an opportunity. Trade opens countries. It opens cultures. It opens opportunities. It opens new things on, on both sides. And uh, that's as it should be. And I think uh, it's been one of the most fundamentally important dynamics uh, of essentially keeping world peace since World War II is trade, to focus on trade. And um, I think it's very dangerous when leaders tend to isolate themselves in a one-dimensional dynamic of those relationships because trade is far more than commercial exchanges, far more. It is everything I mentioned and more. And so I think the the whole uh, complete, <clears throat> excuse me, completeness of the cycle of relationships is whether it's culture, it's trade, Nebraska beef. We import a lot uh, from China, um, and uh, those trade relationships continue to build. They should, and and it something else it does for security. Uh, you can't have trade, you can't have economic prosperity for anyone unless there is stability in the world, or at least enough stability in certain places, uh, that stability brings with it uh, a certain amount of security, and that all brings with it a certain amount of peace. And if you don't have all those components, well, you don't have much, but you can't have one without the other. You can't have prosperity and trade without stability and security. It, it won't work. It never has worked. And so I think, again, we need to always understand, not just here, but in China, that um, it, it all is, a, is part of the completeness of, uh, of the relationship and the enhancement of the relationship, not just the sustainment of it, but the enhancement of it. We can get better at it, and we should, and I believe we will. So as someone born and raised in Nebraska, you were talking about that earlier, about your upbringing in the, in the state. Um, what would your advice be to young Nebraskans? Now, speaking to young people who are coming from where you came from um, on how they should go about succeeding in the global marketplace in the future. Well, first, again, I go back to uh, this point. Uh, 
equip yourself as best you can. Read, 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 read. Understand uh, as much as you can about the world. Uh, so you've got to equip yourself a little bit here too. Um, I think also with that, take every opportunity that comes your way. Uh, you know, there, there's an old expression in the Army over the years now, they, the Army or military doesn't have kitchen police KP anymore. I mean, we contract that out. But you used to be, uh, when you went into the Army, you, would, uh, you did your time peeling potatoes and cleaning the pots and the pans and scrubbing the floors and so on. It was a, it, it was a um, quite um, enlivening experience uh, in, in other responsibilities you'd have. But it really, it trained you well. And I think as, as I connect to that, the old adage is never volunteer for anything in the Army. Never volunteer for anything because you'll be, it'll be a problem if you volunteer. I don't believe that. I take just the opposite. Volunteer for everything. You pick and choose. It all won't work, but do many different things. Make your life interesting and varied and push and push and push and push out. And some of it will work, some of it won't. But I think those are some of the, the major pieces, at least that for me, coming from a little state in the middle of the country. I didn't live in a town over 1,000 people until I was my second uh, high school in Columbus, Nebraska. And so um, that's what I took away from it. It's, and my brothers have done the same thing. It doesn't mean we're special. I mean, a lot of people do it. But I do think that that's advice that I, I would, would continue to give. I've given my entire career uh, to young people. You look for opportunities, make opportunities, and open up. So to provide some context for the viewers here, we refer to Nebraska being a big place, you know, a big, small place, <laughs> right? So a 450-mile-long state, one of the bigger states in the U.S., uh, with 1.9 million people, right? So when, our, when the Chinese students who we have come to Nebraska come to Nebraska for the first time, they, they just can't get over that, right? How this big land mass has 1.9 million of the nicest people in the world that they've ever met. So, uh, Secretary Hagel, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the Confucius Institutes and the programs around the, uh, the country here and around the world tonight, but do you have any advice for the 110 institutes here in the U.S. on how they could improve or grow or develop further this, this concept of sharing of culture and language in the future? Well, the only thing I would uh, say, because I know you all work very hard at it, and, you, and uh, that's the only way you obviously can succeed and grow, but find opportunities as much as you can and in, try and invent opportunities to make the Confucius Centers relevant, relevant to everyday life of Americans, of people, of citizens, of, of everybody. I suspect most people think the Confucius Centers at the universities um, are very good. Probably don't know a lot about them, but if, if they had a, a, a better grasp and connection, connecting point on why are they relevant? Why should I know anything about them or help them or, or add to what they're doing or support them? Because they are relevant to America's future. Uh, they are relevant to the world's future. And um, that connects. And so every opportunity you can find, and I know you do this already, speaking at rotary groups or whatever whatever it is. There's so many ways to do it. Um, and, and always remember that um, institutions are only as effective as they are relevant. And uh, if you are irrelevant, you're not going to be effective and you won't be around long. And in a world that you mentioned, Ronnie, that is so consumed with technology, and think of the advancements just in the last five, ten years. And you go back 20 years. I mean, I could have never imagined when I first got into the cellular business 
what was going to happen. Never, ever imagined. People talked about Dick Tracy watches and all that and this crazy stuff. It's real. And so never underestimate, never, ever bet against or underestimate the human mind, what the, the human mind will develop. And, and that means you institutions stay relevant uh, to why is it important that the Confucius Center be supported. And I think you've got a great story. I think it's, it's a, as good a story or better than almost any story because it is so necessary and relevant to the future of our country. I'm, I'm just struck by your comment about greater outreach perhaps might be another way of saying more attention to the importance of the mission, the why the Confucius Institutes are more important maybe in the future even than today. Um, we happen to be a land, one of the land-grant universities in the United States and a number of the Confucius Institutes around the country are at land-grant universities that have that outreach mission mm -hmm. associated with their state or their, their geography, so to speak. So it just makes me wonder yeah. Our director is here tonight, whether that should be integrated into some of our extension mission and a number of our universities. Um, well, I, I wouldn't trespass on, on your areas here, but um, uh, I, I, my quick answer to that is yes. So, Secretary, uh, any closing comments you'd like to make tonight? First, again, thank you all, uh, and especially our sponsoring institutions, and thank you, Ronnie, for and you, Director, for what you do for not only our state but our country in, in this effort and the Confucius Centers. And to each of you, I thank you again. But I would just add this one point. Um, I think the world today uh, is as volatile and unpredictable and in many ways as dangerous as it's ever been because of all the reasons you all know. Uh, we live in a very hair-triggered world where there uh, is not a lot of margin of error for mistakes, whether it's nuclear weapons or whatever it is, cyber. It's, it's, it, it's a different kind of a world. And, and I think it has, uh, I, I believe it has here in the United States, but I think it has in other countries too, really kind of knocked us off course a bit. And I think it has pulled us away from a center of gravity that has been pretty much a consistency for the United States since World War II for a lot of reasons. And um, that said, and you may disagree with that, uh, but I do believe what I've, I've just said, that should not frighten us, that should not intimidate us, that should uh, challenge us in many ways because at the same time, this is a pretty exciting time to be part of institutions and especially for young people because if for no other reason, we've never seen in the history of man an inventory that we have today to solve problems. The, the mechanics, the technology, the abilities, everything. Uh, is so fulsome to fix things. Now, whether we're all wise enough to do that, we'll see. But that, that really depends on us. And so we will get a center of gravity back. I think we regain our balance in this country and parts of the world, recognizing, though, that it's still going to be a, a volatile world for a long time, because if for no other reason, we're putting two billion more global citizens on the face of the earth by 2050. And you know what goes with that. Water, food, jobs, opportunity, education. And uh, if for no other reason, we've got to get along. We all have to get along. And I am as confident as I've ever been that we can do that. And when I say we, I mean the global community the global community. First of all, the fact that we do project by mid-century that we'll have another two billion people on the planet and that we have to be able to feed those two billion more people sustainably 
and safely and securely um, and with the right dissemination mechanisms for use of food and water. So that's a great challenge we have ahead. And as you know, that's one of our major areas of focus at, at, um, at our university. But I want to go back to something you said in one of your earliest comments tonight when you were talking about the Kyoto Climate Accord. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is a lot of attention at the moment um, uh, globally around what the Paris Accord and, and what's happening there. You, any, any comments you might want to make in that regard? Well, I, I think it was a mistake for the United States to uh, withdraw from that accord. But um, that said, I think it was a mistake uh, not just specifically based on any fundamental difference on, on climate change uh, what causes it, what doesn't cause it, and so on. Sure, that's that's a centerpiece of, of, of the treaty. But it's bigger than that. It's a cooperation. It's a global cooperation. That's what these international institutions, coalitions of common interests we built after World War II, treaties, agreements, are about international cooperation. And... If you start discarding those and pushing people back and suggesting that certainly the United States or and other nations might be better off if we would be more independent and go our independent ways, that is as, as dangerous as any one thing in our world today. All we need to do is just go back to a little cursory reading of history and think about the first, actually not the first, but, but that 20 year period in the first part of the 20th century that produced the three most deadly world wars, tragedies, casualties the world has ever witnessed. Why was that? Be because we saw isolation of different countries doing their own thing their own way. And so these, these treaties, these alliances, these are, are, when you bring countries together, are fundamental, I think, to the future of mankind in our world. It's a great set of ending comments. I'm just, I'm just struck by how what you just said resonates with the whole mission of the Confucius Institute program. So, you know, we, we have a lot of interest in this whole thing of a secure world in the future, right? And the research work we do and the education work we do in the universities around the world are focused in very heavily on that. So uh, it's been a great conversation, Chuck. It's thank been a real me. privilege to be able to have it with you tonight. Uh, again, we thank the Confucius Institute U.S. Center and the World Affairs Council for the opportunity to have this dialogue, and we bid you a good evening. Thank you. The focus of this program is to recognize outstanding young people and some not so young people, ten individuals who exemplify the mission of the Confucius Institute. And that mission is dedicated to the teaching of Mandarin, the development of additional cultural awareness about China. We have ten exemplary students representing the vast diversity of the students body of Confucius Institutes all over the country. To all of the, the honorees tonight, congratulations. You, you really, really, really deserve it. And, but it's not just your, your knowledge of, of the language and the culture, 
it's actually uh, the special spirit that inspires you to do this. And that is really through difficult times, things are not always easy, I know, even at your young age. And these difficult challenges that you've overcome in order to keep this going really require a certain quality of person to do this. If we in America are going to compete on the global platform, we need everybody in this room, and we need more than everybody in this room to be able to feel comfortable in a different culture, in a different context. And many of us here have the fortune to grow up. We grow up with Spanish-speaking people around us. We go up with all different kinds of people. But there are not that many people who really feel comfortable in a Chinese context, in a Chinese environment. And I hope that each one of you in this room knows how lucky you are to have a Confucius Institute as a bridge to help you to feel that comfort and know that, like we heard some of the students saying, it's people. And people need to relate on a human basis. And when you feel comfortable human to human, people to people, you're gonna be a huge success. My mantra, my, my number one belief is that uh, there is nothing better than engagement. Uh, that, that's the way I live. If you are engaged in a common mission with the people with whom you work throughout the world, no one can stop you. We need everybody in this room. We need all of you to take your language and your cultural aptitude and your interest and to combine it with whatever other skill that you're doing. I don't care if it's accounting, I don't care if it's PR, I don't care if it's medicine. Put the two together and help the world connect. They are extraordinary young people and they all have a common thread. Through learning this new language, a whole new world has opened up to them. They see our world in a different way. And not just China, I'm talking about the global community. They're remarkable people, young and old, and I'm very proud to introduce them to you tonight. Americans should learn Chinese because America and China are so connected in economy and trade and in our daily lives, China affects a lot of what we do. Having a strong relationship between these two countries is like is critical and to do so we have to be able to have these exchanges and not just amongst like the major leaders. It doesn't just need to be the presidents of both nations meeting. It needs to be the everyday citizens learning more about each other. The East and the West both have different values and both of them can combine to create something even more powerful. Both countries can benefit from each other and uh, China plays a large role in America's economy and culture. So it would um, help them fully, if they learn the language, it would help them with communicating further. We could solve issues a lot better together by working together and learning how to communicate um, together as opposed to individually. So I think the sum of us together is way better than us to, uh, individually. Americans should learn Chinese just so they're not sitting in their little corner of the world. It's really easy to put the blinders on and not really pay attention to what's going on in the rest of the world, but we all have phones. Technology keeps us so interconnected that you almost can't afford not to pay attention to what happens outside of the United States. It's one thing to go to a place like visit China, but it's another to be able to interact with the people in their own language. Being involved in a Confucius classroom has really given me more of an understanding of not only a language, but a culture. And I've spent the past six or so years really immersing myself in Chinese, from the classroom to the field trips to the music to the people. And I want to major in international relations, and a lot of that is because of the experiences that I've had in my Confucius classroom. Being a part of the Confucius Institute or classroom has impacted what I'm interested in because I've just seen a whole new world open up in front of me as I've learned a new language and a new culture. One of my most memorable experiences was a year ago attending uh, a concert sponsored by the Confucius Institute at Portland State University. It was a performance of Gu Cheng and Pipa, and it was uh, one of the most beautiful things I've seen and heard, and that's just so memorable to me. Every single day that I walk into the Confucius classroom, and it can be the little things like 
writing little brief skits just to practice our Chinese language or singing the cheesy songs that my teacher pulls up. I think that just that every day of, of experience of being able to sort of be immersed in an entirely new culture for 90 minutes um, every class period is just great um, because it's not something that I have the opportunity to do outside of my classroom. My family doesn't speak Chinese. Um, I only have like one or two friends that also speak and study the language. So I think just being able to be immersed in that culture and know that I am learning about something that is entirely different to my own experiences. I'm really expanding my viewpoint in every single sense. I would just say just jump right in and start learning um, and you can do it especially when you have things like the Confucius Institute behind you. My favorite aspect of my Confucius classroom is my teacher Lilasha and I've had her for all four years and she's become like a parent to us and I really appreciate her as a person because she takes our language learning and she gives it so much more life. We learn about her life in China before she came here, we learn about her children, we learn about her life and she's really become part of our Confucius family. Before I was in the Confucius Institute, I was just taking Mandarin lessons from a private teacher. So once I joined, I noticed a variety of classes ranging from Tai Chi to cooking, and it was really helpful because you can't learn a language in a vacuum. You need a community that understands how to speak the language to help you, and it's really important that it exists. It's such a big world, and such a diverse world, and there's so much that at least for me, we don't e I don't even know what I don't know. And so by having educational cross-cultural experiences, I, I think it helps us broaden our horizons, it helps us deepen our understandings, and it helps us build connections with people. This fall, my family and I were fortunate to be able to spend almost a month in China. Being able to visit China and speak to other middle schoolers entirely in Mandarin is something I never could have imagined a few years ago. It all happened because of my friends at the Confucius Institute at William & Mary College. I shared my experiences growing up in the U.S. and the Chinese students shared their experiences growing up in China. I asked them what they would like people in America to know about middle schoolers in China. Can you guess what all of the kids wanted us to know? Like kids everywhere, they all shouted out homework. They said that they have way too much homework and not enough time for social and fun activities. They seem to think that American kids just have fun all the time. <laughs> this is not true, by the way. <laughs> so what I really want to do is raise my hand and raise a toast to everybody here and to say thank you so much for getting it. Thank you so much for being part of this and understanding it and to help us achieve what's going to be so important for the people that follow us.